It's now more than five years since the British government stepped in to rescue RBS from total ruin and prevent the potential complete collapse of the economy. For the first time, someone has brought together everything that happened at RBS right from the start. From when it was initially founded as a humble Scottish bank in 1727, to its near death in 2008 as a sickly monster bloated by greed. That person is journalist and author Ian Martin and his book, which features testimony from almost all the key players both before and after its rescue, is called Making It Happen, Fred Goodwin, RBS and the men who blew up the British economy. Ian came into IB Times UK's Canary Wharf office to speak with us about his book. Thanks very much for joining us Ian, we appreciate you coming in. So first things first, why did you want to write your book Making It Happen? Well, I mean, it struck me as the most extraordinary set of events to have lived through. And I felt that uh, as the years passed um, after the crisis, that a lot of the answers I was getting or the version of events I was being told as a, as a consumer and as a taxpayer and as a writer um, were inadequate and partial. Um, so I wanted to do a number of things. I wanted to firstly tell the full inside story of what happened and what went wrong at RBS specifically. But I wanted to go a bit broader than that as well and look at the role of the regulators, the auditors, the politicians who declared the end of boom and bust uh, and um, try and explain what all of them, Fred Goodwin right through to Gordon Brown, Mervyn King, etc., what the hell they thought they were doing. You've got so many behind the scenes insights and tidbits from was throughout the book from all the people you've spoken to, but what did you find as, was the most revelatory insight or the thing that most shocked you? I think the thing that shocked me most was that having interviewed more than 100 people at length for this book, and the vast majority of them being bankers or people intimately involved in the crisis, was how few of them, probably I could count on the fingers of one hand, how few of them appeared to have undergone any kind of moral or ethical crisis about what happened. A lot of people uh, could explain why there was a perfect, uh, why what they did in the run-up to the crisis and run-up to disaster made perfect sense at the time and that um, a lot of it was someone else's fault. But in terms of putting their hands up and admitting that they were kept awake at night by what had happened and by mistakes that they perhaps made or their failure to intervene at key moments or their failure to resign. Hardly anyone in the book resigns at any point. That really surprised me, I suppose. Five years on from the crisis, I expected to find a bit more reflection on the moral and ethical uh, components of the story. But perhaps that's again is, perhaps that's human nature that after a disaster like this, people People look to suppress thoughts of it and, and get as far away from it as possible. I guess their stop defence is going to be, we did nothing illegal. <laughs> Which, Absolutely. of course, they didn't, but, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't huge moral and ethical questions. Absolutely. The question that I'm asked most by, uh, by audiences when I speak about this is that uh, people say, why aren't, why, aren't they in, why aren't some of these people in jail? And the answer is that almost, almost everything that happened in the run-up so the crisis, which was which the biggest economic shock in seven decades for the UK economy, a catastrophe for UK living standards, and we're going to be living with the, with the impact and the effects for a very long time. Almost everything that was done to lead to the crisis was entirely 100% legal. 